the people's platform good evening and welcome to the people's platform now as sri lanka navigates its socio-economic landscape the importance of mainstreaming sexual and reproductive health and rights has never been more critical the intersection of health education and human rights is vital in empowering individuals and societies especially marginalized groups to access essential services and make informed choices about their bodies and futures. In Sri Lanka, we witness how cultural norms and socio-political factors often influence discussions around sexuality and reproductive health. Tonight, we'll be taking a look at the importance of integrating SRHR into the mainstream discourse by exploring its impact on public health, gender equality and overall societal well-being in Sri Lanka. I'm pleased to welcome to the studio country representative of the United Nations Population Fund in Sri Lanka, Kunle Adeni. Welcome to the show, Kunle. Thank you so much, Sonali. Thanks for having me here. Oh, it's a pleasure to join Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Kunle, <laughs> In Sri Lanka, there is an overwhelming societal reluctance to have conversations around sexual and reproductive health and rights for cultural reasons, religion, politics. Um, and when these conversations are not being had, society regresses. Why is it important to mainstream these conversations? Uh, and how would this mainstreaming benefit society and all its stakeholders? I think you have addressed the question in a very nice way to see what so this society faces or loses when it doesn't have the conversations and the right conversations around sexual and reproductive health. Um, I think we are societies of culture. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was Peter Drucker, a renowned American author, who says culture is strategy for breakfast, meaning that we just lose a lot and we forget even the best of strategies can suffer from culture. And it's not only in Sri Lanka that this issue that you raise is affecting. We are from the global south and we understand that we are just not comfortable talking about sex and sexuality. Mm -hmm. We oftentimes people feel like when you talk about sex, you have had sex, you know, and the, the, without the understanding that sex is probably the most natural thing that could happen. It's essential for our procreation. It's essential for our replacement. It's ordained and it's meant to be one uh, a means of our replacement as a human race, but also to be enjoyed and understood. However, sexuality is another component, which is completely different from sex. Do we have the composure, the understanding, and the temerity to have a conversation about sexuality? I think not. Um, and because of that, we expose people to issues that they are not ready, especially young people, to deal with. Um, often, and I'll give you some basic examples. How many young girls know anything about menstruation when they started to menstruate? Mm. You know, that this just that factor of not understanding their body, understanding their health, and how to look after themselves exposes them to uh, genital infection that could have lifelong consequences. And if a woman or a girl or, or even a boy is not healthy, that is inimical to the socioeconomic development of a nation. So even if you're not looking at it from a health perspective, or you're not a rights-based person, and you, but if you think of the development of Sri Lanka as a country, it is important that we have this conversation around sexual and reproductive health for many, many reasons. And that is that keys into understanding how we build our population, how we build our people to be responsive and to be able to look after themselves and reproductive citizens. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that very comprehensive introduction. Now, um, this question is a bit of a lengthy one. The International Journal of Sexual Health, in an article titled In Pursuit of Pleasure, a biopsychosocial perspective on sexual pleasure and gender, says deep-rooted ideas that uncurbed sexuality is dangerous probably reinforce many parents' fears that a positive approach to sexual health and sex education will entice innocent children and adolescents into engaging in sex that they are not yet able to consent to. 
Yet, there is substantial and convincing evidence that comprehensive sex education is associated with adolescents engaging in intercourse at a later age, with more consistent condom and contraception use, and lower unwanted pregnancy rates in both developed and developing countries. Countries that promote abstinence-only sex education or no sex education usually perform worse on these indices of sexual health than countries that provide comprehensive and positive information about sex to adolescents. Now, Kunli, in Sri Lanka, because of this demonization of and reluctance towards comprehensive sexuality education, our children, our youth, our adults have no grasp of the science behind and the discourse of sexual health and rights. And this what it does is this necessarily opens the floodgates to misinformation, disinformation, um, harmful myths that have immensely dangerous uh, impacts on uh, society. You've been engaged in advancing SRHR uh, across other parts of the world as well. Speak to us about how dangerous it is for Sri Lanka not to have um, an effective comprehensive sexuality education program? I think that's a very good question. And it's, uh, I would tell you that the, the report you just quoted is absolutely 100% right. Mm -hmm. um, the quick answer is that it is dangerous and inimical not to provide young people with access to age-appropriate, uh, age mm -hmm. context-specific, and culturally relevant. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll come back to why I said that comprehensive sexuality education. And I think it's important for us to understand what comprehensive sexuality education is. It is really giving our young people and even adults at some point access to information and services that improve their lives, mm. that help them to make the right choices, informed choices. Just because we, if we were to teach a young person mathematics, we, we want the person to be able to be an engineer and learn and do things. You have to do physics and biology and all that to be a doctor. But we want a person to be a responsible citizen and look after themselves and their life. But we deny them information and services. That's, you know, the easy way to explain it. However, we speak about age appropriate. Mm -hmm. It's imp I, the first to say, it's fine. Not everything should be taught to everybody at every time. Sure. It's okay. That's why we have curriculums in school. Yeah. But it's important that our young people, especially in the early part of their life, before puberty and post-puberty, are able to have access to age, um, uh, age-appropriate, mm -hmm. context-specific, which is what is happening in their local, but also culturally, culturally relevant. Yeah. Sri Lankan culture is important. We cannot do without our culture. Mm -hmm. that, but that empowers them. What comprehensive sexuality education is different from the natural health education is that it's relevant around everything instead of just teaching sex and reproduction telling you this is your body this is what this does this is what does it tells you everything around agency autonomy what to do consent how to negotiate your way in difficult um, issues more so he also teaches men respect the concept of respect how to manage a relationship how to understand your body and to also be respectful and also do things around informed consent so it's very important and why do we say that it's dangerous not to give up people people would you see education has been liberalized mm. Our young people have access to the social media we cannot curb what people have access to today what we need to do, so why don't we work to put a structure whereby we guide people with what helps them to live an empowered life? Mm. And I'll tell you this, for example, being, research shows that giving access to comprehensive sexuality education actually reduces incidences of gender-based violence because men understand that patriarchy and, does it, and being able, even thinking that you can hit a person is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. Evidence suggests that a considerable number of women, percentage of women in Sri Lanka, believe it's okay for their spouse to hit them. You know, but we nobody wants their child to be hit. Nobody wants anybody to be beaten because violence leads to death. We have increasing numbers of teenage pregnancy. You know, and we know that if a girl has information, research suggests they have information to knowledge and service, they know how to negotiate their way, they know what they shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And it tells them, encourages them to delay. In fact, 
comprehensive sexuality education rather than the public think thinking delay sexual debut mm. girls who have access or young people who have access to CSC actually delay their sexual because they know that they do not want to have things that disturb their education or their access to productive services but we also know that in a country like Sri Lanka where we really don't have a pathway for a girl to return to school after pregnancy for example so yeah. when we have teenage pregnancy most of these girls are actually not able to hit their fullest potential for the want of another word or, yeah. an, or another language so with, it's very clear that it's important to invest in comprehensive sexuality education parents my care we have opponents to comprehensive sexuality education but it's more than to have a conversation and i'm very glad that the government of sri lanka is taking that more seriously mm -hmm. uh, recently the ministry of health through the health promotion bureau have done videos on comprehensive sexuality education trying to educate you know the sri lankan young person on how to actually look after themselves and understand their sexuality however we need more concerted effort to include this systemically in the school curriculum the school has access. Teachers must be comfortable talking about sexuality. Mm -hmm. You know, see, the parent, the principal, everybody must be comfortable to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong in a young person understanding their sexuality, protecting themselves. And sexuality is not sex, like I said. Sex is a different thing. Sex is an act. Mm -hmm. You know, comprehensive sexuality education is teaching and giving people access to, to life-empowering information. And it's important to invest in this. Absolutely. Um, Kunle, dignity must be at the core of any education on sex. So must consent, so must respect and kindness. And these principles seem to be largely lacking or even absent, which is demonstrated through the hundreds of daily police complaints across Sri Lanka, uh, the court records, domestic violence cases, and the untold hidden stories of predominantly women. What steps can we take to ensure that these principles are upheld in practice? The principles of dignity, kindness, compassion, respect. Education, education, education. I feel like every day we are learning, you know, so there are many things that are rooted in social norms or culture. We can't complain. Um, our culture, excellent things around culture around the world but we know that as humans as the human race the more we know the more we adapt mm. and i was telling someone a few days ago there was a in some communities they used to kill twins in the past okay. they used to kill um, it's just around the world like mm. they used to do those kind of things like like the violence and like it's i'm sorry you know those terms are gory but do horrible things because that was the understanding but we cannot turn a blind eye to evidence. Yeah. You know, so evidence is very clear that dignity and respect are rooted in human rights. Sri Lanka has, has been very proactive in adopting or ratifying human rights-based conventions, Convention mm -hmm. on the Rights of the Child, the CEDAW on, on, on uh, gender-based violence and discrimination, and many more, even access for people with disabilities. Sri Lanka has ratified those models. But we need to typify that in our actions and bring it home to our people. It is very clear that when we have respect for ourselves, just the way that we expect a strong cultural respect for elders, we also need to bring it on and land it with respect for ourselves. The woman is not an object to be disrespected. It's important that the woman is respected and the dignity of women is very key. So how do we do this? we need to have advocates and i'll just speak of, of two things and mm -hmm. over time we've seen significant i must give uh, respect to the many women rights organizations in this country that have worked well there are many legislators that have been championing issues around equality and access because many things are rooted in an equality basis and we understand that we, are, we the human race come from a time where might was right mm -hmm. and but things have changed now so in sri lanka we need to involve on considerable advocacy not fighting but our conversations with evidence mm -hmm. to have conversations with people um we need to show more evidence to people on how the issues that we speak about affect the development of this country 
everybody loves Sri Lanka. Every Sri Lanka that I've met is extremely passionate about the country. Mm -hmm. So can we begin to have conversations in making people understand mm -hmm. that everything we talk about, denying a woman access to sexual and reproductive health, dignity, labor force participation, mm -hmm. you know, respect, is inimical to our development. It doesn't take us to the Sri Lanka we want. Mm -hmm. Women are 50, 50 to 51 percent in this country, but less than 30 percent labor force participation. Women are excluded from decision making processes, you know. And this, so if women are not in the places where decisions are made, access to resources, put money in sexual and reproductive health, put money in comprehensive sexuality education, then we begin to lack and we suffer for it because mm -hmm. a major part of our population is unable to contribute to the development of this beautiful nation. So we need to advocate, we need to work, but it's important to catch people young. I see a significant opportunity in our school system to work on reviewing our school curriculum as we are really working now. I know the Ministry of Education is in a process of revising the curriculum in a way that is responsible to the 23rd century, you know, moving to AI and all that. Mm. But we need to give it a human face. What do our people need? to have so that they are ready to take advantage of AI and all this, and that is comprehensive sexuality education. Fabulous. Um, we are in conversation with Kunle Adeni. We're going for a short commercial break. We'll be right back. The People's Platform. Welcome back. I'm in conversation with country representative of the United Nations Population Fund in Sri Lanka, Kunle Adeni. Uh, Kunle, I'd like to speak about the importance of access to sexual and reproductive health and rights in Sri Lanka. Um, a 20-year-old English-speaking graduate from an upper-middle-class uh, background will have greater access to and acceptance when seeking out um, sexual and reproductive health and services. Um, whereas a 20-year-old Sinhala or Tamil-speaking garment worker from the free trade zone from some village who is earning a basic wage will suffer as a result of a lack of access. So these inequalities are quite stark and brings about desperation, helplessness, unwanted pregnancy, suicides, infanticide, abortion and the list goes on. How can we best address this gap? Again, that's a very good question. So when we begin to talk about access to reproductive health, information and services, we, as with many things in the world, we try to address rights by being general in time past. So we just give the same thing for everybody. And that's, I'm, I'm sure you've seen that imagery of equality and, and equity, equity yeah. you know, like a test thing. So being generalistic, you know, can, you know, address a lot, but it doesn't reach the people left behind, the most vulnerable people. So in every population, there are people who general approaches do not target or do not reach. So for example, if a family planning clinic operates from 8 to 2 p.m., but that is exactly the same time that garment production, I don't know, really happens. So the woman has no time or no free time to actually access the services that we're talking about. It makes it difficult. We cannot say that we have provided services for that woman because we are, that's a particular work time for her. That's a time she has to earn a living. It's a thing we have to think about. I, will, I can also think about people with, living with disability. You know, are buildings, are they disability accessible mm -hmm. where you have information and say, can someone who is hard of hearing, what is the health worker's ability to communicate to someone who cannot hear or someone who cannot see? Uh, uh, information in Braille and all those kinds of things that provide more access. So, so there is a lot around that. But I also know that in areas that are urban, there is more access, mm -hmm. especially to information. Because the more you go from urban areas, the more we find more gatekeeping. Yeah. That's the word I'll call it, yeah. culture and all that. It's mm -hmm. a, People are freer if you came from a rural area to Colombo, you have probably more access. And this is in every country, it's not just Sri Lanka. So mm -hmm. 
it's important to be specific to understand that the way we give information in Colombo to a 20 year old English speaking is completely different to the way we provide information and access to services to other people, including and particularly people with, living with disabilities, which is almost 10% of our population, which is going to increase as we diagnose more disabilities. So uh, I completely agree with you that the issue of access for everybody is is limited and sometimes data fails us because we look generally we don't disaggregate data so we can say a particular high number of Sri Lankan women or young people have access to these things but what about the percentage in a subset of the population so can we say what percentage of uneducated women mm. or what percentage of these women with disability or what percentage of these people have access to sexual and reproductive health information and mm -hmm. services. So I feel like the way to address it is one, to first understand and agree that this exists, that this inequality is real. I do not believe it was intended, it's just reality of what we see is what we respond to. Mm -hmm. And majority is what always wins, right? Mm -hmm. However, the human rights-based approach and the way we uh, is that we need to put a human rights lens, an equality lens, and a principle that the United Nations champions called leaving no one behind. Meaning we have to look at those vulnerable groups and look at their major peculiarities. So how do I make sure that someone who is uh, cannot see, you know, has can at least get information where well, Braille, and now UNFP has worked on a glossary, you know, okay. for uh, on sexual and reproductive health information and terminologies for people who might not be able to read or hear. And they can, so we have a glossary for, for those kind of people. And we continue to do that. We have disability inclusive maternity kits for women who are about to deliver. Uh, in uh, 2023, during the, the, the uh, we reached about 20% of women living with disabilities with sexual uh, reproductive information and services, including cash to support them. Because many of these women might not even be able to come to the MOH office. Right. You know, they might not be able to come to the yeah. MOH. So is the PHM, is the public health midwife reaching out to them? How can we do that? So there's a long way to go. But I must again acknowledge the work of the Sri Lankan government and the Ministry of Health in trying to advance access to information and services in its own way. There are challenges, but there are opportunities. But the first thing is to work with the realization that we are not all starting from the same place. And with that, we would continue, and at the United Nations, we will continue to bring knowledge, information, to see how we can particularly address these this issues. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the intersection of um, gender with SRHR. Uh, women are disproportionately uh, impacted by backward societies. Uh, and I'd like to speak about how culturally uh, this concept of shame is weaponized against the woman conceptions around um, how to be a good woman the sinner saint dichotomy uh, how patriarchal and misogynistic norms play into further undermining uh, a woman's intrinsic embodied power speak to us about that okay so i think uh, <laughs> good to hear that i think i was speaking at a forum a couple of weeks ago and it, it just struck me that and we were talking a lot about women, how this is, the body, pregnancy, dressing, and all. And I, I, it, it struck me that the woman and her body is probably the most polished entity in the world. Yeah. Like the institutions police the women, government police the women, policies and laws that are aged police the women, mm -hmm. um, moral police the women, mm -hmm. society polices the women. And, and, it, and it's, it is like that. Uh, but we've seen um, improvements in this area as well. I'd like to acknowledge that. Uh, but the concept of shame is, is real. It is, it is there. Uh, it will change irrespective, but it should change for the positive and change quicker. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, shaming a woman for her sexuality or for her understanding, or, it leads to lack of expression. So I feel like, and we understand that when women don't express themselves, when they don't share their needs 
and knowledge and ideas and information. One was denying them a fundamental human right and the opportunity to live life to their fullest potential. I do not believe that that is the intention of any parent. I do not believe that is the intention of any guardian. Mm -hmm. And that certainly shouldn't be intention of any religion, government, or but culture is deep. But the understanding that the idea of shame is not necessary. And when we talk about sex as well, you know, we understand research shows that most couples do not even discuss you know, having a conversation around their desires, which is perfectly okay and normal. It should be, you know, but that concept about what we should never talk to, we address it in, in, in comprehensive sexuality education, about being free to speak about things, mm -hmm. you know, and not, not there, there's nothing to shame. And I'll tell you many things. Research shows that many communities see menstruation menstruation the most natural thing that it's important for a replacement mm -hmm. you know as something that is shameful mm -hmm. girls don't talk about it uh 25 percent of girls miss school because of menstruation we don't support them you know so in many countries including in sri lanka we see many processes ad hoc or not to provide uh uh, uh, uh menstruation and, and and pads and all that but is it holistic? What conversation are we having? Does the boy know what menstruation is mm. in our communities? How many boys understand that the average cycle is 28 days? How many boys understand that the average period is three to five days? How many boys or the girl even understand that when you start menarche, the first two years are irregular? How many people understand the hormonal issues that are associated with menstruation and how to respond to that? And it keys to many things. And I started from menstruation, which is puberty for a woman, to menopause, which is the end of our reproductive life. Sadly, that, those two extremes and everything in between is stigmatized. Mm. Even in menopause, we don't talk about it. Yeah. Many women hit menopause without knowing what hit them. They don't know because it's shameful to talk about this is what I feel as a woman. I have heat for, I have hot flashes. I do this. I have headache. I don't want to work. I need you to turn off the air conditioning in the office. Mm. Things that people feel people are sometimes, you know, going through things that nobody understands. So it is important for us to really open up the space for conversation. And, and you know, everything I've spoken about now, I've not even discussed sex. You know, which is the problem exactly. that, we, that, that we think. But, you know, our inability to discuss sex has removed the denied of the opportunity of the complete well-being of a human being of 50% of our population. Affect the dignity, affect the confidence, affect the opportunity, affect the right to be productive in the society. And it's really, really wrong from a human rights perspective. So, the idea of shaming, there is nothing shameful about a human being. Everything we do is natural. Sexuality is not shameful. The idea of sexuality is not shameful. Discussing sexuality, and we can learn from other clients. And, and I, don't, I, I don't pretend that we need to pick everything from every client, but we need to actually use evidence. What have people done and what has happened? Mm -hmm. You know, how long are people living? How productive? are people, you know, and how do people find fulfillment? The essence of a country, a government, and a people is first for the security and well-being of its people, but also for the fulfillment of the ambition of its people. And I think we can really do more in that area. Absolutely. Kunle, along with the weaponizing of shame against the woman, comes the denial of pleasure of the woman. Women are discouraged from sexual expression, sexual agency, and research clearly outlines a tremendous pleasure gap between men and women. And this is so crucial to the flourishing of a society. Uh, we, we can't possibly have any more generations of unhappy, unfulfilled women. How do we fix this? I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I, I feel like either two, society 
considered marriage or partnership or courtship um, essentially for procreation, right? Over time with knowledge, it became contribution, building a unit to support society. Mm -hmm. But at the age we are in now, it's about people must find themselves in a relationship before mm -hmm. they can give. What you do not have, you cannot give. Mm -hmm. If you're not happy, if you're not good, if you're not comfortable, if you're not confident, if you don't feel empowered in the relationship, there's so only so much as you can give. And I feel like the human race, not only in Sri Lanka, humanity, but especially us in Global South now, continue to lose fundamental, you know, opportunities and resource to this thing. And I was reading something about from the International Conference on Sex, Sex and Sexuality about the pleasure issue. Every, both men and women are kind of often assume their opinion of sex of the other person. So you, you just spoke about the woman not, you know, having pleasure and the satisfaction of men. Men have their own idea of pleasure. But what is the conversation? And I addressed, and I spoke about it in the in the mm -hmm. in my in my earlier intervention. What is the conversation around pleasure? You know, should is sex something that should be had as a as a responsibility? Mm -hmm. That's a, it's an important question to put there as an idea, mm -hmm. but also something that you give yourself to. Remember that we speak about consent in sex. So even the idea of sex should be consensual. And consensual assumes that the person understands what they expect from that experience, but also that there is a value that is coming from that experience. Mm -hmm. Many women are not getting the value. That they and I think it comes from our societal issues. And it keeps back to our conversation of the opportunity to speak freely about things to be able to have a conversation i really feel that conversations ends everything and is the beginning of everything it's important that we as a society understand that it's okay for a woman to express herself you know it's okay for partners and men or partners to understand that women have desires sexual as well but men also have desires so it's okay to have those conversations mm -hmm. and build and, and I feel like if those conversations are hard and unison and everybody desires to be responsible to their partner, to their chosen partner, we will get better in this, in, this, in this light. But I really believe that the conversation starts from the moment of respect, because if I respect the other person, I will care about what they yeah. desire. If I respect them, mm -hmm. if I see them as human and dignified, like you said, I will care about the expectations of me and how do I, and the person, we speak about love and desire, the person you love, you should be interested in giving them joy and happiness, including in the bedroom. So, so these are things that we really need to explore. But also I think by conversations like this, we need to have it some more, uh, be open to having conferences and meetings and people, and there's so, there's a plethora of research Mm -hmm. you know, about sex and sexuality. And it really comes down a lot on socioeconomic, uh, socioecological models of security and the layers really speaks about the need to have, you know, a uh, conversation and understand um, sexuality desires, yeah. which is key. Absolutely. How must we go about um, um, moving these conversations from um, conference halls, from research, uh, research books, to uh, society at grassroots levels um, across the country in, in, in a manner and form that is digestible to them? Okay, excellent. A very good question again. You see, first and foremost, I, I would like to speak to every, every responsible person, every parent, every mother, every father. It's important to speak to your children. It's key. The limitation and going through my life, I've seen myself in many situations that could have been dangerous. And I'm not a woman. I understand that my realities are completely different from that of a girl. I have that understanding. Mm -hmm. And I've seen girls that I went to school with fall by the wayside. Teenage pregnancy, confusion, abandonment, drop out of school, chase from their homes because of the idea of shame in those days that you as a girl got pregnant. Mm -hmm. But did the parent perform their responsibility 
of even having a conversation with the girl child that if you delay sexual relations, if you do this, if you did this is the information, you might, this is where you're going to. So we leave people uh, beyond that. So I start with the family units and everything. It's important for us to have those conversations. Parents need to be comfortable with educating themselves. I've seen that also change from my time. You no know, generation amongst millennials and that it's a, it's, it's a little different. Be comfortable with having relationships with their, with their children to have conversations. The, the gap between parents and kids sometimes is, a, is big. Secondly is the role of the gatekeepers and the institutions. Education, like I spoke about, is important. There's a lot that has been said in conference rooms. There's a lot that that we've done working with government, but we need to put our money where our mouth is. Mm-hmm. And we need to be comfortable with making sometimes unpopular decisions because people learn and also be comfortable to go into communities and have these conversations. Uh, to understand that people who have the knowledge of the importance of comprehensive sexuality education of the rights of women, of sexual and reproductive health information and services, must be able to bring that out. We must put that in curriculums of schools, from vocational institutions to, to regular schools, to just help everybody understand themselves, even if we're not talking about sex. For a girl, the limitation of the education a girl has is shocking. I spoke about men are key. Many girls wake up and find themselves stained and have no idea of what has happened. It's a shock. It's many things. Many girls are told the silliest of things that if you did this, nothing will happen to you. If you don't do this. And they, they have the lack of knowledge and opportunity to negotiate for themselves, to make informed choices. So the school system is the structured way of passing impactful knowledge to kids. It's important that we find a way to incorporate context-specific, like I said, culturally appropriate and age-appropriate comprehensive sexuality education into our school system. And finally, is that we need continuous conversation and advocacy. It will not end. We need to be free to talk about it. And more when our gatekeepers, government officials, health workers are educated, we need to do training and retrain those people. Our health officials must know their role. Their role is not of moral policing, but of providing information and services. That is their duty. Doctors have sworn the Hippocratic oath. Mm-hmm. Nurses have theirs. The public health midwife has theirs. If your job is to give information and services, please remove your own bias that must come mm-hmm. from and provide the right information to people. I think with that, and we, we will be taking you know, and, and driving at these at these changes that are necessary. Yeah. Kunle, in Sri Lanka, there's a lack of access to comprehensive and holistic reproductive health services for everyone. And I want to talk from the context of pregnancies from rape or incest. Speak to us about international best practices and how regional countries uh, handle situations such as these where the victim survivor is helpless and has no recourse to adequate remedies? I mean, thank you so much for that question. Again, I was at the forum. These are things that, you know, interestingly, I'm so glad that you bring up these issues because they are really contextual issues in Sri Lanka as we speak mm-hmm. today. Um, rape and incest is a very inter- interesting, for the want of another word, area in pregnancies. Um, rape is a crime. So I'll, I'll start by this. Rape is not consensual. Rape is gruesome. And, you know, it, it, it is it is everything about rape is negative. And it comes with abuse and assault. It's a form of assault. And it's a complete violation of the woman's body, soul, and rights. So when a person gets pregnant from rape and then they have by legislation to carry that pregnancy to term, a child that they probably do not love. Sometimes this is a teenager who is a child herself being made to compulsively carry a pregnancy to term and probably raise a child as a result of rape and incest. I think that's something that really needs to be discussed, like Mm -hmm. if if that is the society we, we want. However, 
I'm not oblivious of the fact that there are many interpretations to this. There are religious connotations that do not encourage any form of termination. Sri Lanka had legislation that is about 140 years old that criminalizes termination in any instance. However, recently, the termination has been allowed, you know, if the woman's life mm. is at risk. Mm. Uh, but it's important to explore some other areas. If you did not intentionally have um, coitus or sexual relations, if you, you stay by yourself and, and that, that happens, who, if you do not intend to have a child by any means, if you're not ready to have to get pregnant, if you're a 14 year old child who is a child yourself and had to go through that gruesome, life changing and often life defining moment, mm -hmm. and then you have to carry that pregnancy into time, but also saddled with the responsibility of raising mm -hmm. an infant who, of course, has no sin, but raising that you're not expecting, taking your own childhood away from you in such instances. I think it's important to really explore that in many countries, and that to answer your question, including, I think, India uh, uh, and South Asia, uh, 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 termination is, is, is allowed in instances of incest or, or rape, mm. in, including some South Asian, uh, you know, Western countries. Many countries have revised their legislation. Sri Lanka uh, is, not, is, uh, is yet to do that. But mm. it's not only on incest and rape, in other areas where it wasn't a choice. And, and I think that fundamentally for us at the United Nations and the United Nations Population Fund, we really believe that we must uphold rights and choices of people. You know, going through pregnancy and having a child and raising a child, I do not think it's an easy endeavor. I do not think those decisions are made uh, uh, easily. And I think those choices should be left to the woman, you know, to make. And this raised to the issue of dignity and respect that you, that you speak about. So um, we're hopeful that this conversation will continue. Uh, we understand um, um, uh, opinions in this area. We do not necessarily agree with every opinion, but, but it, it's something that really, really needs to, to, look, uh, to be looked at going forward. In the context of gender-based violence and marital rape, which is not recognized as a crime, as a penal offense in Sri Lanka, speak to us about the dichotomy of the disempowered woman versus the entitled man, briefly, if you can. <laughs> you know, uh, so I, 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 a study that we conducted with the government in 26, 2019 indicates that about 40% of women in Sri Lanka sadly believe it's okay for their partner to hit them. And, I, I, and that's violence already. Um, conversations go on about the duty or the responsibility of a woman in form of relationship and sex. So, I believe oftentimes a man might feel like it's the duty of, a, of the wife to provide sex anytime, you know, he wants it. Uh, I'm not sure it's the other way around, <laughs> you know, that the woman, you know, can demand sex. And that that's also plays a role of respect and how we see ourselves in relationships. That's one of the things we talk about in comprehensive sexuality ed education, respectful relationships, how to understand relationships. You see, so now this has been going on for long. It's culture. It's passed on from generations, even unsaid. It, but it's not going to end in the immediate. But we really need to invest in new population to start thinking about this thing. Why should anybody want to force, you know, the, the spouse or the partner in a way that, and it's gruesome, you know, you know to, to do that. And because it's not penal, even if it was penalized, we know that how comfortable is a woman to report that the husband violated her. Mm. Even violence, we know that about 50% of violent cases of vi actual violence, not even, are not reported, you know, for many reasons that mm. I wouldn't go into. So mm. we know that, but this is preventing, this is hurting women. And sometimes this leads to untold consequences, mm. including death. That's the extreme. And we yeah. know that we've seen yeah. those kind of things. We've seen uh, femicide, significant femicides. Oh. You know, the, fe the rate of femicide in Sri Lanka is considerably high, unfortunately. Oh. 
Mm. And that is someone losing their life. But how we as a as a country and a community of humans also look at these things is different. We, if I were to walk out of the door and I was to hit the producer or somebody on the street, I probably would be arrested. But if a man was to hit a woman on the road, we would check if it's the wife. If it's the wife, we look away. It's not our business. Forgetting that the woman has an autonomy, and that keys into what you were saying, the autonomy of the woman to decide whether she wants to have sex, when she wants to have sex, to negotiate. There's always negotiation in everything. And that's what we must introduce into the older generation, but also the younger ones, to see, to have respect and to negotiate for what we want from time to time. Mm -hmm. Uh, an area that I'd like your perspectives on, Kunle, um, persons with disability are not seen as sexual beings. This is hugely exclusionary, hugely discriminatory. Uh, it is of pivotal importance that um, they are included into mainstream society policy. Uh, how, do you, how, must, how must Sri Lanka work towards this? Um, a very, very good question. I mean, the people living with disability are, are considered a vulnerable group for many reasons because oftentimes they are not seen. In Sri Lanka, about 8 to 9% of the population are living with a disability or another, and it's projected to increase by about 24 to 25%. So it's going to from a major part of our, of our population new disabilities have been diagnosed, you know, people are saying, but the importance is that when we speak about a disability, we know that disability is inhibiting mm. in itself. So if someone doesn't have legs, for example, they cannot come out to do something. You know, if someone doesn't have eyes, they cannot, you know, see you and I as we do. So it's in, in inhibiting. And I spoke about it earlier. It affects them in many areas but also their sexuality. We do not, you know, we can do more in looking after that. They're not seen as sexual beings, you know, because number one, if we do not make an effort, oftentimes society doesn't see them. You know, society doesn't see this population and it's it's a major issue. So like I spoke about, how do we, on the, how many, and you know, we have, society has defined its own idea of sexuality. And say, so, the question I will ask is that we see fashion shows and we know how those are sexualized and everything and the expectation, a description of how someone will look. Mm. It will be interesting to see a designer and people who, who would do, you know, to, like, like, what are we doing around people with disabilities and the opportunities to, to participate in that as a, as a subset of our population? What, what is our idea of sexuality and understanding the needs of people? People would always go with their preferences, but people with disability have sexual needs, but also need access to information and service. And that's what I, I would like to focus on. We can do more around that. We can provide more information. We can include and incorporate issues of people with disability in all our information and communication mm. around sex and sexuality. We can do more as a people, including us, including the media and everything, to highlight the people. Because if we don't do that, we are really not doing what we say we would do about being rights-based and incorporating every part of our society. Kule, my final question, uh, going beyond conversation, how must we as stakeholders apprise the state, government agencies that are <coughs> instrumental in effecting these shifts by bringing in policy, by implementing policy? How do we bring in other key stakeholders, um, other agencies um, in order to mainstream sexual and reproductive health and rights for all? <laughs> I, I mean, that is another very good question. You know, uprising, I call governments and communities and and at government at all levels, um, societies, organizations, including ourselves, the media. I, I think that we're all duty bearers in yeah. this in this area. We're responsible to the people. Every government elected, every government suggested and the trust of his people and the desire. Mm -hmm. And government must desire to do what is best for its people. Now, government also stands at a pivotal place to also show, to guide, is like Shefa, 
of people mm -hmm. towards what is right. But I understand, and I must, you know, I, I, I spoke earlier about the incredible love of Sri Lankans for Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. you know, and it's key. Yeah. So I believe everything government does, you know, is sometimes with the best intentions. And sometimes some things look difficult to do, but we need concerted effort to follow evidence. It's important that evidence is done. Sri Lanka has done very well. Maternal mortality is going to double digits. Sri Lanka is one of the best countries comparing to Western countries in the number of women that die while giving birth. Access to that is considerably good. Of course, there are some, some issues there and in many areas. But the question we have now and that we're focusing those left behind, those populations that were not reaching and how we ignite the power of this population to do greater things. And I think that we will continue to talk to government. Government is open. Government is, has done great work. I spoke about many things government has done on sexuality education, trying to do it in their own way. I see partnerships. I see organizations like Family Planning Association in Sri Lanka. I see many women rights organizations doing uh, many things. But I feel like we just need to put a concerted effort, including the media, to champion this course and also speak about number one, the basic rights, dignity of people, especially women. If we believe and we understand that we all have rights, including women, to achieve our fullest potential, that is the beginning of the conversation. And I think we have that idea. Secondly, if we know that everybody, every Sri Lanka is important to the ideal of the Sri Lanka we want, including 50% women, we will think about it differently. But finally, if we know that we all have rights and choices of people, we will do more in this area. And I'm looking forward to working with government, to continue to work with government to do more in this area, to the extent whereby we have a Sri Lanka, you know, where every, uh, 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 every pregnancy is wanted, you know, every childbirth is safe, and everybody's potential is fulfilled. And I'm confident that this, gov this country is on the pathway to do that but we just have to accelerate our effort to the promised land. Fantastic. Uh, Kundi Abeni, this was such a comprehensive uh, discussion. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you so much. Always good to be here. Thank you for watching us. We'll see you again next Friday. Good night. <laughs>